Welcome to the Quiero.com Spanish Property Podcast, where we interview people who recently purchased a home in Spain. They tell us what worked, what didn't, and what they'd do differently next time. I'm Beth Davison, and today I'm speaking with David from Durham, who owns four houses in Oliva, Valencia. Now landlords as well as property owners, David and his wife Cynthia have seen the region change a great deal over the years, and despite the expat community, would love Oliva to stay their best kept secret. He worked with estate agent Aliva Casas to find his dream home in Spain. Check out the show notes at quiero.com forward slash podcast to find links and resources mentioned in this episode. My name's Dave and I'm retired and I live in Oliva and currently I have four houses in Oliva. One that I live in, two that we do long-term rents in and one that we do short-term rent in. Wow, and was it always the plan to have multiple properties? No, it wasn't. Unfortunately, I had to retire early. Um, so that puts us in Oliva um, many years ahead of what we thought. So that gave us different opportunities. And um, we've been very lucky to have Jane from Oliva Castles uh, guide us over the last few years. And we picked up some good properties and made them into a bit of a pension plan for ourselves. Yeah, it sounds like a big venture. So how long ago were the very first conversations of Let's Head to Spain? I believe it or not, 1985, we bought our first property. And that was literally just somewhere to get out of the UK. It was a miserable, rainy, bleak Sunderland Easter Sunday and we thought we just can't stand it anymore. We need somewhere where the sun shines. So we bought a house then, and then um, we sort of been coming for that 25 years uh, for the odd summers. And then eventually we decided we'd like to live here in Oliva. Uh, so we bought the second house, and it's gone on from there. And was it Oliva that you were in in 1985? Is that where you were visiting, or have the regions that you go to sort of changed over the years? Uh, no, it's it's always been Oliva. Um, it seems to just be the sort of town we like. We, we came, fell in love with it in the first few days we were here and have been in love with it ever since. Wow, that's great. So you've really seen the area change and evolve over time. Yeah, back in 85, 86, 87, there were very few expats. Um, and then quite a few Brits came and went and then the Germans came and went, and the Dutch came and went, and then the Brits came back. And now, right now, there's a huge influx of uh, Brits and uh, Germans and a few French starts. It's becoming very cosmopolitan here in Oliva. And do you like that? Do you like the kind of socialising element to it and the multiculturalism of it all? I do, but I hope it doesn't get too full of expats because I do love where we live now. We're surrounded by uh, Spanish people. Um, they speak Valenciana here in Oliva, so they don't speak Castilian. So it's nice to, to feel a part of of the real Spain. It's, it's a working town. It has a couple of orange factories, orange juice factories. Um, and so, yeah, I think the expats coming help to, to revitalize the town. Um, but hopefully not too many because we do want to still live in a Spanish town. Yeah, no, that's fair enough. I can understand that. And so how long ago was the purchase of the second place? Uh, the second house was in 2000. And was it all always your plan for that to be a kind of investment and that, that to be, make you some money? What what led to that conversation? Yeah, again, we, we had... Um, since you and I had been living in, in Indonesia and we came back to the to Europe and we came back with our expat bonus and nothing was happening in the banks. So we bought a, a two-bedroomed a bungalow with the thought that it might be a good retirement home um, because there are not many bungalows in Oliva. So two double bedrooms on the ground floor, sitting room, dining room, um, Nice big, huge sun terrace if you can get up the, the one set of stairs. So that was originally bought with a vision of we could retire in it. Um, and we 
did a lot of work to it, got it fully renovated and looking very pretty. And then a, a super Dutch couple came along and asked if they could rent it. So we rented it to them. And now we have a Romanian, a Romanian family are living in that house currently. And that's one of our uh, long-term rents yeah. that we have. Yeah, so it all kind of evolved, but it was never the the kind of original plan for it. And it's great. Was it a daunting thing to become landlords in a foreign country? Um, yes and no. It's always a little bit scary because of the tax implications and, and making sure you don't upset too many locals or upset the, the, the local authorities. Um, but again, with, with Jane's help and our, uh, our lawyer, Joaquin, um, we sort of tread our way through it the second time, not a problem. Then the third time was um, about 2014, which is the one we bought for us. That's when I retired. And then we bought this one to live in. Um, and this, the one that we're in current that we're living in is was pretty much already renovated. So we just had to add some final touches to it to, to make it livable. And so it was in 2014 that you moved permanently out there. And that was when the big relocation happened. How, how difficult was that? How hard is it to relocate permanently? Uh, I think if you do your research and, and you use reputable companies, it's very easy. We used uh, a local company to us in, in Essex um, who advertised that they had a Spanish partner. So we researched the Spanish partner. We got some good feelings from them. I sent them a few emails, told them the address they were going to be delivering to because a lot of Spanish towns are one-way streets, just wide enough for, for a car, never mind a big truck. And um, to my surprise, the, the company here in Spain sent me a photo of the house. They said, is this your house? Is this your street? Um, we found it on Google Maps and we were... We're very happy that we can deliver all of your stuff there, no problem. And so, so they made it very easy for us. Fantastic. And did it make the landlord process easier now that you're in the same country? And presumably, how far are you from, from your tenants right now? Um, this very moment, I'm five minutes from two of the houses and seven minutes from the other. Yeah, so and it's all really it's, it's all boots on. That's right, boots on the ground for us. Um, we used Jane as our, uh, we bought, the last house we bought through Jane and we used Jane as our rental agent. So she controls everything for us and makes sure that we're all legal and, and she's there as the emergency contact. Um, but it is nice to, to be around. So for example, this morning, um, some of our uh, short-term renters have come back. Um, they, they're, they're from Darlington. And they've come back to uh, to stay with us for six weeks and they couldn't get on the internet. So rather than Jane have to do it, uh, George just called me and I just popped around and set up the internet for him and going to get him some wood for later. And so it's nice to, to be able to be available to you, to your tenants, um, but also to have Oliver Cassis and Jane to... Um, to do the legal stuff and to be the, the main focal point. Yeah, totally. It's a really nice kind of combination of the two. And when you were looking at the properties initially, how did looking for a property to rent differ um, to looking for a property that you guys were going to live in? What, what priorities changed for you? I think you need to understand the market. And so, for example, here in Oliva, probably 500 euros a month is the maximum you're ever going to get. So then you have to work out, okay, if I'm only, if I'm only going to get 500 or I'm, well, going to get 500, what is that percentage in return for you? And um, so you have to set your budget according to what you want uh, on, on your return on investment. So, for example, the one we just bought in November, uh, we were looking for upwards of 4%. So we looked at several houses with, with Jane, found the one we liked. It sort of fell into our price range. And then in Spain, you need to work out or you know, find out from the estate agent uh, who's paying the fee. Because in Jane's case, the seller pays the fee. 
But in some Spanish estate agents, it's 50-50. The seller and the buyer pay the fee. Some of them charge only charge the buyer, so it's like a finder's fee. So you need to understand those things. Once you know that bit, you then have to roughly add 15% onto your buy-in price to cover your uh, purchase tax, which is 10%, and then your legal fees and your notary fees. and So then you build it up from there. So you've got your, your base price plus your 15%, um, and then you look at what renovations you're going to do, whether you're going to rent it with furniture, without furniture, roughly how much that costs. Then you get your, your sort of your rough ballpark figure at the end and work on how much rent you can get and have you got your ROI or not. Right. And it, you sound very knowledgeable in this, probably because you've done it several times now. But how much of that knowledge did you have already going in and how much of it was entirely new to you and just, just research that you did? Um, I had no knowledge when I went in. <laughs> uh, I, I think we learned a lot from the first house and then learned more from the second house. Um, and then once once we got to know Jane and Oliva Cassis and Joaquim, our lawyer, um, they just made it much more fun. And the more we the more we looked, the more we, the more we realised what the opportunities were, the more we realised the pitfalls. So again, here in in Oliva, um, there's problems. There can be problems with electricity. So you need to understand how the electrics work, what what potentia is it, um, do you need a new bulletin, do you need an outside meter. Um, so understanding the, the local bylaws and what it's going to cost you because a lot of houses still have an inside electric meter. And new law says the, the meter must be outside. So that can easily add 600, 700 euros to, to your purchase price because you're turning the meter around. And once you've turned the meter around, unfortunately, you have to have ID Roller, the state electric company, come and check it for you and approve it, which is another 300 euros. Um, so it's all those little things that you learn that, and just pick up along the way. And if you have good folks like uh, Jane or, or Joaquin, then they're holding your hand. And, and, and I found myself now. If, uh, if Jane's a little bit pushed, she'll ask me if I'll show a house to somebody. And um, and then I can explain all that to them. Add your 15%, look at the electrics. This is this is potentially another 4,000 to have it rewired or uh, look at your water pressure, stuff like that. So the student becomes the master. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> and when it comes to your your own house so the one that you then decided to live in what talk me through that process a little bit how many did you view before you found the right one what was it that you were looking for and originally the, the the two bedroom bungalow that i told you about we thought we would maybe renovate that and put a second floor on it and so we went off and, and found a, a an excellent architect who had a lot of um, sway with the local town hall. And he, he came up with four or five ideas for us. But then when we asked him if he was project managing, uh, how much would he charge? How much did he think the project would be? And he said, oh, between 700 and 800 euros per square meter. And then we suddenly realized, wow, it's cheaper to buy a house that's already available and, and pretty much done. So that's so we started to look and probably saw somewhere between 15 and 20, 25 houses and had pretty much given up on finding what we wanted. Suddenly a friend of ours said, you know, there's a house around the corner. The guys are selling it and we have keys and we got to the front door, opened the front door and looked at each other and thought, this is it. Just Which must amazing. have been such a good moment. If you were already, we, when you say you were at the point of giving up, just because everything you were seeing wasn't quite right? That's right. It's all, you just didn't have that, that wow factor, that cosy feeling that, that you need, I think. And I tell that lately over the last three years in particular, there's been 
lots of people moved to Oliva um, and, I, and friends of ours or friends of friends. And when I show them around, I tell them the same thing. Just keep looking and keep looking. And when you look at each other and smile, you know you found the right one. And so what was it about this house that, that made you look at each other and smile? The initial impact was the, the two huge original front doors that that would allow the donkey and cart to come into the house and go to go to the barn at the back. So those were still there intact. And then as we came into the house, the big high ceilings, just the layout. Uh, having lived in Indonesia, we had a lot of big, heavy wooden furniture that we brought back with us. With us. And we could see it would all fit in this house. And, and as we got further into it, we realized that um, at the back of the house is a almost a private apartment, um, which is where we live. So we have uh, our own bedroom and ensuite at the back of the house. And here in the front of the house upstairs, there's two double bedrooms and a bathroom and a sitting room. So just instantly set all sorts of imagination going on how we could adapt it and develop it to what we want. And then our family and friends can come and visit and they live at the front of the house and we live at the back and we meet in the middle for yeah, for lovely. lunches and dinners. And, and so do you, do you mind me asking what your budget was for something of that size? For, for this house, um, <clears throat> we were hoping to, to get it under 200,000. Um, and that's euros. And we had, euros, correct. Yeah. And we got it uh, for substantially less than that. So we were very blessed. Wow. It seems amazing. For that much space that, that you're kind of describing, it just seems really good value. No, it really is. Compared to other parts of Spain, I think Oliva is still the best value for your pound or your euro. Um, it's, it's in the middle of the two airports. So you can fly to Alicante or Valencia. It's on the autopista, so you've got a toll road that can get you right here. It has its own off-ramp. Um, and it's, I think because it's still a working town, you can, um, you can pick up some good properties. The, the one that we've just bought through Jane and have almost finished renovating, we've just actually had a tenant sign on the dotted line today a Dutch gentleman to rent it for a year. But in, in our research, in our research for looking at where we could pitch the rent on that, uh, we had some German friends from Stuttgart uh, were over looking for house, looking for apartments rather than houses to buy. And um, Jonathan went to look at it and we said to him, you know, what do you think? We're, we're looking at maybe four, four fifty a month for this. And he said, he told us that in Stuttgart, he'd be paying 4000 a month for it. So yeah, it, it, Oliver and the surrounding area is very good value for money. And the great thing about Oliver is we're literally, this house is three and a half kilometers from the sea. And it's, we have more than 30 kilometers of Blue Ribbon Beach. So Lovely. it's ideal. Yes, yeah, so you've got loads. And how often do you have visitors how often are there people staying in your house? In a, to come and actually stay with us, um, probably every couple of months. We've got, uh, got some friends coming to stay for Easter, had friends just leaving. Uh, in our rental houses, George and Carol are back. Uh, so they're, the short-term renters tend to come back uh, two and three times a year. Um, so, yeah, we, we're constantly getting visitors. We're very lucky, though, that our closest friends um, have a house just around the corner from us. They moved here from Essex as well, and they have a bar. So they, they we're only five minutes away from Bar Amigos, uh, which is Chris and Lloyd's bar. So, and they've just been on the TV as well, so that's bringing people to our leader. Oh, that's they, so they nice. Apart. They were part of the um, A New Life in the Sun show that just literally was on TV last week. Um, so um, most of our 
friends are sort of slowly moving here and having their own houses. Brilliant. You started the wave. You started the trend. That's great. So (laughs) (laughs) what would be your kind of central advice to people thinking about doing what you did? I know it was in the 80s that you originally did this and times have changed a lot and the landscape has changed a lot. But yeah, what would what would your central piece of advice be? I I think the main thing is to take your time. And if you can possibly afford it to rent for three or four months and and know that this is the town or the country you want to be in, because it's, if you make that mistake, you could possibly never recover from it. And I, I tell all, all my friends, you know, rent for a little while and make sure. And when you're renting and you're wandering around, you're getting a feel not just for the town, but for parts of the town, for the areas you like, the areas you don't like, the people you like, um, the, the facilities. Um, so it's, it's all about, you know, you, you hear it all the time, location, 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 but it truly is. Take your time, find the right location, get the right contacts. Um, again, I, I know I keep pushing Jane, but Jane's an amazing uh, lady. And, she, she will hold your hand through everything, even down to um, how you pay your taxes, who your tax advisor should be. She'll give you two or three choices. Lawyers, get the right lawyer, get one you can trust. And if possible, find somebody like me or, or some, another friend who can go into the house with you and, and share their experiences of how how dirty it can be to, to renovate a house. And, or how clean it can be, depending on what you're doing. Yeah, totally. Well, it sounds like, I mean, you're just a wealth of advice. My last question, speaking of that location, 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 is what is it that you love most about kind of your new Spanish life as opposed to your old British life? I think the wonderful thing about Spain is that the sun shines more than 300 days a year, which is amazing to wake up every morning and see the sun shine. Uh, Spanish people have this amazing habit of wanting to say hello to you, even if you don't know them. Everybody says, hello, how are you? Everybody's smiling all the time. So I like that. I like to wake up in the morning and think it's going to be an amazing day. And uh, back in the UK, the the last few years, uh, I felt that the weather wasn't very nice. It's always quite dark and gloomy. And that reflects in the people too, where people are heads down and getting on with their lives and not particularly enjoying it. Where in Spain, enjoying life comes first and making money comes second. It's a big, it's a big, big, big difference in the in the mental attitude. Yeah. Well, it sounds fantastic. You've got me convinced. <laughs> and thank you so much for answering all of my questions. It was really, really helpful, and you had some great advice. Well, if I can help anybody, I will. That's that's what it's all about. Marvellous. Cheers, David. Have a great day. Take care. Have fun. Bye now. Thank you for listening. And thanks to David for sharing his experiences, along with Oliva Casas for their help to make this episode possible. I admire how David turned his early retirement into an exciting opportunity in property development and how close their new home is to their tenants. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast so you never miss an episode. This podcast is produced by Quiero.com and our mission is to connect you with estate agents and properties throughout Spain. Whether your dream home is a rustic farmhouse surrounded by olive groves or a lock-up-and-leave apartment on the seafront, you'll find everything you need at Quiero.com. If you've enjoyed this episode, we'd really appreciate your five-star rating on iTunes. It helps us reach and connect more people with their dream home in Spain. And whenever you're ready, here are four ways we can help you. Ask a question by emailing beth at chiero.com. We'll try and answer them all in an upcoming Q&A episode. Get a location guide also by emailing beth at chiero.com. We'll reply with the latest data and information on the areas you're interested in. Calculate your budget. Simply visit chiero.com forward slash budget, enter two numbers and you're done. Be our guest. If you've already purchased your home in Spain, we would love you to share your story on the podcast. Just email beth at chiero.com and we'll take it from there. Next week, I speak with Nikki from Braintree, who purchased a house in Galera, Granada with her husband. 
Tune in to hear why Nikki described their purchase as the craziest thing they've ever done and how their new life involves salsa three times a week. I'm Beth Davison, and you've been listening to the Quiero.com Spanish Property Podcast. I'll see you next week.